Welcome to EPG Patshala. We are dealing with the paper English Literature 1590 to 1798 and today we are studying the unit on backgrounds to the study of Renaissance drama. I am Anna Kurian and I teach at the Department of English, the University of Hyderabad. Now, Renaissance England is known as the golden period of English literature, far more than any other of the periods in English literature. And this is so because of the outpouring of poetry that took place over there. And this poetry was both in terms of drama as well as non-dramatic verse. So it was the age of the sonnet, but it was also the age of drama, which was written in iambic pentameter. Now, the heyday of English drama, which takes place there is primarily, of course, because of William Shakespeare. But we have also had playwrights such as Christopher Marlowe, Ben Jonson, John Webster, Thomas Middleton, etc. during this period. And therefore, drama flourished. Now, reading the drama in isolation is all very well. But ideally, we should also know the social, historical, political context in which these playwrights lived and worked. And so today, in this lesson, we shall be looking at a few of those contexts. One will be travel and exploration. We shall also be looking at the role of the other. And we shall be considering how drama actually came to be during this period, as in the origins of English drama in the Renaissance age. And finally, we'll have a short unit on the popular dramatists of the age. In addition to this unit, it is useful to look at the unit on backgrounds to the study of Shakespeare during this in this lesson because then you will have a more rounded view of what exactly transpired during this period. Now in terms of travel and exploration, this is the age when English sailors finally begin to go out into the world and do their little bit for exploration and discovery. Now Portugal and Spain had been part of this exploration drive far earlier than England had been. But during Elizabethan England and after is when English sailors finally begin to dominate the waves. During this period, sailors such as Francis Drake circumnavigated the globe. Several of them went to the New World, they explored new regions, they went to Africa, they went to areas in the Pacific and they went of course to the Americas. So the English then discovered that there was a huge new world out there and this new world was full of new cultures, new races, new people groups and new ways of life. So the strangeness that the English sailors discovered over in these new areas during this period is something that colors the writing of the period as well. Now in addition to seeing all these new things, they also discovered new items of consumption. Tobacco of course is the one which we are most familiar with because they brought tobacco back and it became a fashion to take tobacco during this period. But they also brought back various kinds of fabric and cloth and they discovered the use of spices in their cooking and the use of cocoa. So what we see is that there is exploration, there is discovery, but there is also then trade and therefore new avenues for trade opened up. And this trade was in various kinds of things. So from precious jewels, gold, minerals, mining, activity but also trade in human beings and the slave trade begins during this period. Now these explorers and sailors who went on these long voyages who conducted these trips of discovery they became prosperous they became upwardly mobile. Now upward mobility during this period is interesting because it was not just the nobles who went on these trips but also people from the middle classes and sometimes even from the lower middle classes. Because of the wealth that they made on this journey, the queen was happy to favour them and because of the queen's favour then they rose in the world as well as in they no longer remain lower classes but some of them were given titles, some of them were given jobs in the government and when the Spanish Armada came to fight against the English, these were the sailors and explorers who then helped in defeating the Spanish Armada. So we see then that there is a lot of connection between what happens when they travel outward and what happens when they come back to England. When they come back to England, they come with wealth. And when they come back, they also come back as national heroes because they have gone, seen new places, gained a name for England all over the world. This was something that had happened earlier only with Spain and Portugal. And Spain and Portugal were seen as being ahead in the race for the waves of the seas of the world. But now England begins to catch up. But, and this is again interesting, is what is what happened was that while they were national heroes for England, they were also seen as pirates by the other European countries. Because when they met a other country's ship out on the open seas, they often then tried to 
board the ship, defeat the sailors and take their cargoes for themselves. So while they were national heroes at home, while they gained wealth and prosperity and status at home, abroad they were known as English pilot, pirates. Now, how this forms a context to English literature is because many of these voyagers wrote accounts of their travels. They wrote and circulated accounts of where they went, how long it took for them to travel there, what they saw there, and then those accounts were brought back and they were published in England in English. And this led to a lot of stay at home English men and women also then recognizing and knowing about what was happening in the wide world outside. Now, we would have thought that only a few people were literate during that period and therefore only a few people would understand what these people had seen. But playwrights such as Shakespeare, such as Marlowe, such as John Webster or Ben Johnson also read these accounts. And they depicted on stage these new lands, these new people and races and cultures. So what we see is a dissemination of these voyages of discovery and exploration, not only via the printed word, but also on stage, which is why it becomes important to look at travel and exploration as one of the primary contexts for Renaissance drama during this period. This period is also significant because when we think of colonialism and we think of India as a colonized land of the British, we think in terms of the 18th and the 19th centuries. But the East India Company was founded during this period. It's founded in 1600. And the Virginia Company, which colonized America, is also founded during this period. So what we think of as a colonial enterprise of Britain begins during Shakespeare's time, during Renaissance England. And when we see what they did later on, when they were able to take over the, all of America and all of India and several other countries as well, it begins in a trading company called the East India Company, another trading company called the Virginia Company, which goes to America. So these are the beginnings of the colonial enterprise in England and which later on spreads all over the world as well. Interestingly, the first colonies that were attempted during this period were total failures. So you have Virginia, there was a colony called Jamestown, which was set up in 1607, which didn't really succeed. And before this, in the 1590s and the 90s, Walter Raleigh attempted to set up a colony as well, which also failed. So the first colonies were all failed colonies. But the attempt itself was significant. And we also should recognize that Renaissance England, which includes the period approximately till the 1640s, is also seen as the time when the first embassy from England comes to the court of Jahangir in India. So 1616 is when you have the English embassy headed by Sir Thomas Rowe coming to India. And the presence of the English men and women in Indian courts may not have been remarked on so much in Indian literatures, but we know that in English literature, it forms a major idea, a major theme. Now trade flourished and a lot of wealth came with all this travel, colonization, all these trading voyages, all these explorations. Lots of wealth poured into England. But alongside trade, alongside discovery, there's also one more element which is significant. And this is that what we think of as the missionary enterprise of the English men and women. That also began during this period, the Virginia Charter. The charter to the Virginia Company, which was during 1607, 1609 and so on and so forth, they very clearly pointed out that if there were people who did not know Christianity, then they should be introduced to the ideas of Christianity and they should be converted to Christianity. So the colonial enterprise, which is goes hand in hand with the missionary enterprise, also then begins during this period. Interestingly, the East India Company did not have this mission. They were only interested in trading. The Virginia Company, which was more of a settler enterprise, they were the ones who said that they should try to make other people, heathen people or the native people into Christians. Then, of course, people looked outward. Now, the people of England, when they looked out, they saw lots of interesting things, but they also saw lots of interesting and strange new people. And this is something which has been remarked upon in several plays of the period, that they looked and they saw people whom 
they did not recognize as being human. The most famous example, of course, comes from Shakespeare's Othello, where he talks about people who have heads beneath their shoulders and the anthropophagi. guy. But these are representations that are seen elsewhere as well. And this is also seen in, of course, The Tempest. Now, these people were seen as being both monstrous as well as exotic. And the English looked upon them with wonder as well as with strangeness. Interestingly, several of the people who never traveled anywhere also saw these people because they were brought back. Now, when we said that people traded, they also traded in humans. So some of these sailors used to capture native people from other cultures, other countries and bring them back so that they could be put up as museum exhibits in England and people paid money to go and look at them. They, of course, died very quickly because they could not survive in the hostile climate of England an unfamiliar place, a hostile place. But nonetheless, they were seen as exhibit items, like museum items. And so people were familiar with different categories of people. And these strange people who look different in terms of appearance or who behave differently because of the clothes that they were, wore, the food that they ate, the culture that they had, these were seen as the other in early modern England. The other in early modern England is not a fixed category. Now, the other in any time, at any, in any part of the world is usually never a fixed category. So at various times, at times of stress and tension in a community, anybody could be considered the other, whether it is of the same race, the same culture. Sometimes people of the other gender might be considered the other and so on and so forth. People with different eating habits can be considered the other. Anything is possible. So it is the other is therefore not a fixed category. It depends upon circumstances, upon the time during which whatever event is taking place and it depends upon the behavior of any given person. Now, in early modern England, at various times, various foreigners were considered, of course, the other, especially if their appearance was different. So if you have people who are obviously different in appearance, such as the Moor, or the Turk, then, or the Eskimo, and there were Eskimos who, came, who were brought to England as captives, or the American Indian who was also brought as a captive to England, then these were very obviously in your face, in appearance, the other. But there were also people who looked racially similar and yet were considered the other at some points in time. These included Jews, who, if they did not dress in manners which were peculiar to them, could pass off as Englishmen and women, but were seen as the other. Certain women could be considered the other. So if you were a nag, a shrew, a scold, or if you were an old crone, then you could be considered a witch and therefore the other. You could also, and this is something which is rather curious, that even amongst Christians, they could consider the Catholic the other at any given point in time. So the range of people who can be considered other in early modern England is fairly large. In early modern drama, Renaissance drama, we see several of these ones in the drama of the period. And we see especially the foreign other. The foreign other, of course, the newly met races who were seen as having a different appearance, different modes of dress, different religion and culture, different foods that they ate and different habits of life. So people were very fascinated by the fact that Indian emperors such as Jahangir had huge harems. This was something that they made much of and this was seen as being extremely foreign and therefore extremely other as well. Now, English men and women who did not travel saw this of course in print, but they also saw this in the drama of the time where it was shown on stage. Eastern emperors who had large harems. It was, the large was signified maybe only by a few people, but nonetheless it was said that these people had large harems. Now it was shown on stage, they read about it in print, and this is the period when the first embassies begin to come from foreign countries to England as well, foreign as in non-European. So when the Turks and the Moors sent embassies to England and these people walked in the streets of London, then these people the English men and women encountered the other right there at home. They also saw black people in um, England for the first time during this period in largest numbers. In fact, the numbers were so large that the English men and women petitioned Queen Elizabeth and she issued an edict asking them to be expelled from England. The Jews, of course, were always seen as the other. And there were also captives who came. So, as I said, mentioned previously, the Eskimos, one such 
who came as a captive and who died in London. They were also then familiar with all of these via all these medium. So this encountered them in real life, but they also encountered them in print as well as on stage. The most vilified others of all the others were the Turks, the Jew and the Moor. Now, there is a particular reasoning behind, in the, behind this, that the most vilified were the Moor and the Turk. The Turk was of course, by this period Constantinople, Constantinople has already happened and the Turk has been victorious. So the Turk was seen as being inimical to Christian civilization. The Moor, of course, on account of his dark skin, his peculiar fe features, was also seen thus. The Jew, though he might appear racially, physically similar, was seen as somebody who had, and this is the Christian viewpoint, who had been instrumental in the crucifixion of Christ, who was a moneylender, and therefore then was always seen as the other. Now, all these three are always seen in fairly stereotyped ways. So you rarely have a heroic Moor or a Turk or a Jew. Instead, what you have is evil ones. And these, their evil is of a peculiarly manipulative nature. This is especially true, of course, of the Jews. So we have Christopher Marlowe in his Jew of Malta, who gives us Barabbas, an evil, wicked, cunning, manipulative Jew. And interestingly, alongside him, he also gives us an evil Turk, Ithamor. Now, between the two of them, they encompass all po possible evils. So they do everything, whether petty or major evil, which provides them entertainment. And we are all, of course, familiar with Shylock's representation of the Jew in uh, Merchant of Venice. And then there is also Sh Shakespeare has an early representation of a black man in Aaron the Moor in Titus Andronicus. And this, of course, excludes Othello, a heroic Moor. Now, all of these, the black men as well as the Jews, as well as the Turks that we see on the English stage during this period or that we read about in dramas of the time, all of them are seen as evil, thoroughly so. And yet, there is some element always that is unsettling in this representation as well. And that is because even as they were shown as completely evil, they would be given one human touch. So Shylock, of course, is extremely fond of his daughter and he talks about his wife who loved him. And that makes him akin to the others who are watching him and they recognize that even he is human. Othello is, of course, the foremost in this in terms of how unsettling he is because even as he is different because he is black and he is old and he is a general and he is stupid, he is also similar in that he loves his wife and he is unsettled at the thought of her adultery. So portrayals of the other during this period in drama at least were interesting because even as they showed us complete evil, they also showed us one human element which made them as human as those who were viewing them or reading about them. Thus, we have a far more nuanced portrayal of the other during this period than we have had in later times. From now, we move on to the origins of Renaissance drama during this period. Now, Renaissance drama does not burst into flower out of nothing during this period when, from the 1570s or so when Renaissance drama begins to appear. And the great drama comes, of course, from 1590 or thereabouts till about 1625 is the heyday of the Renaissance drama. Now, it just doesn't appear out of the blue. Instead, there are several antecedents to it. And these are antecedents which come about from a variety of sources. The first, of course, are the Christian drama, which was prevalent in England before Renaissance drama appears and these include the mystery, the miracle and the morality plays. Now they are all different categories. So you have the mystery plays and the miracle plays which one is about the life of Christ, incidents from the life of Christ which is the miracle plays. The mystery plays deal with the lives of saints and then you have the morality plays which showed the conflict between the good and the bad as they fought for the soul of a human being. Now all of these were church dramas of one kind or the other. Now, these church dramas were initially performed in church surroundings. So, within the church, at the doors of the church and into the churchyard. And later on, they were taken out and performed in village halls or in village greens. Now, these are some of the early 
predecessors of Renaissance drama. They have contributed severally to Renaissance drama. They have given a stock character. So, the vice or in English drama, Renaissance drama, you have the jester. The jester draws upon the vice of the morality play. Then they gave us themes. The theme, of course, the ever prevalent theme of good versus evil or the fight for a good man's soul. Those themes are drawn from early morality plays and elements of form and the struggle between two characters for one person's soul or one person's affections is again a form element which is drawn from a morality play. The best example for all of these is of course to watch something like Dr. Foster's Christopher Marlowe's which gives us elements from so you there you have the vice you have Mephistopheles who features as a vice. You have the struggle for his soul which is demonstrated for us via the bad angel and the good angel. And the constant struggle which is prevalent through the play is something that would have been familiar to people who had seen morality plays from earlier times. In addition to the Christian drama of earlier times, the Renaissance drama also then integrated features from court entertainment such as the interlude and the mask. Now these were entertainments which drew mainly upon music and dance. They did not really have a strong storyline, they did not have a plot, but they were entertainments devised around song, dance, music and this is something which also features in Renaissance drama. Especially if you think about it, comedies which have music, which have songs, even Place such as the Duchess of Malfi, which has songs being sung and people moving around on stage, and set drama incidents, plays within plays, all of these are features which are drawn from interludes and masks. The third and most important element, once again, is the fact that all of Renaissance drama draws from early classical drama as well as early classical texts. And this is significant because though the Renaissance dramatists were not very familiar with Greek drama. They had a solid grounding in Latin drama of the time. So they were familiar with Horace. They were familiar with several of the other texts of Latin literature as well. And this influenced their work in early modern drama. They were also familiar with texts such as Ovid's Metamorphosis which provided them with themes and elements and characters for many of the dramas that they were writing. So the influence of classical literature on Renaissance drama is something that is fairly strong and we see it also in their knowledge of and acknowledgement of Aristotelian precepts in the drama that they were writing. Now we come then to the forms and features of early modern drama. And it is simple, of course, to say that the main forms were the tragedy and the comedy. But tragedy and comedy were not just simple, boxed in, easy categories which had similar features. Even within the tragedy, you could have subcategories. You could have the mingling of tragedy with other forms of drama as well. So tragedies, subcategories would include things like domestic tragedies, which are basically family stories, but which end, of course, in tragedy. And an example of this would be Arden of Faversham. And then there was the revenge tragedy. Most famous example of that, of course, is Hamlet. But you also have other examples during this time. The earliest is the Spanish tragedy, but you also have the revenger's tragedy, Antonio's revenge. And these were some of the other examples of the revenge tragedy of the period. The revenge tragedy, which began as a fairly stock feature where somebody sought revenge for evil that had been done to him or his family members upon somebody who was seen as uh, impervious to justice and who was not going to be within the ambit of the law developed in the hands of Shakespeare into something far more impressive, psychological and which had so many new connections and aspects that it no longer remained only a revenge tragedy. Now, if you were to think of Hamlet, Hamlet is usually classified as greatest tragedy of them all, yes, but also in terms of subcategories, it's called a revenge tragedy. But it could also be called a domestic tragedy because it is a family story. It's about a man who's killed by his brother because the brother wants to marry the man's wife. And it's about how the son sets out to revenge himself upon the man and his mother. So in one sense, it's also a very human family story that is being told over here. So these categories then are not exclusive and watertight. They all leak into each other. Similarly, comedies were of various types. The two main ones which we are familiar with during this period are 
the romantic comedy popularized by William Shakespeare of course and the city comedy which was Ben Jonson's oeuvre and he made a lot of it by plays such as Every Man in His Humor, Every Man Out of His Humor and Volpone and all the others as well where a city was the location for the comic action and in that city you did not have so much of the romantic aspects as you did in Shakespeare where everybody is busy finding love. Instead here you saw a city which was evil, which was corrupt, which had elements of wealth of course, characters who were very wealthy but also characters who were gullible, who were foolish and easily fooled by the city smart people. So various kinds of uh, tragedy as well as comedy. Another category during this period, a popular category is the history play. Now the history play begins as a play with an independent storyline of its own during this period but its predecessor is something called the chronicle play which was more of incidents and events which played out featuring the same characters but not necessarily having a strong plot line. The history play developed from this with a strong plot line featuring the same characters etc. So you have the chronicle play would be an, an example of the chronicle play would be Marlowe's Edward II. But the history plays of course the most famous ones are once again Shakespeare's with things like Henry V and so on and so forth. Now even though they were supposed to be representations of history, it was not necessary that it was only history. It could also be a lot of fiction, a lot of stories which were being told and popular fiction around those characters, stories that circulated about great kings and queens, these were all incorporated into the history plays. Now in addition to all of these, there were several categories which overlapped with each other. So you have tragical histories, histri historical tragedies, you have melodramas, you have comedies, you have tragic comedies and so on and so forth. One category which gains a special status because once again Shakespeare used it was the fact that there was something called the romance or the tragic comedy and these romances began by moving towards tragedy but towards the end they then shifted and became comic as in they had a happy ending. Yeah, so these plays were written in blank verse, most of them were though the several of them also have large portions of prose in them and this was unrhymed lines of iambic pentameter. The interesting thing about it is now we consider it poetry but if you were to read it aloud it still sounds like prose, speech of the time which is why it has so much resonance when spoken out loud rather than when read on a page. Now one of the main features which again everybody is familiar with is the fact that only men acted on the renaissance stage. There were no women no female actors and therefore all roles were played by men. Now what this does of course is it gives men primary roles but it also makes it impossible to have an idea as to how this worked out. Women represented by men and especially when you think of a play like Shakespeare's as you like it where a girl character is then shown up, shown to dress up as a boy and so on and so forth. So it created a complicated structure and this was something that many Puritans also disapproved of because men dressing up as women they said confused other men. So it could lead to trouble as well in matters of sexual morality. Now not just was it that men had to play the roles of women but because the playing companies had very limited numbers within them most of the character, uh, most of the actors also played more than one role. The principal actor would play only the chief role but others might play at least two, sometimes even three roles in the same play, especially if they were bit roles. We know that this is so because there are records of this that people played multiple roles during this period. Now one of the other important aspects of the period is that there was censorship and this censorship was pretty strong as in the court as well as the church both of them could censor any given play there was a master of the revels who was responsible for sanctioning a play and if he disapproved of the content of the play then the play of course was not staged at all but and this is where it becomes interesting if a play managed to sneak onto the stage or if a play managed to sneak certain things onto the stage 
and if it was viewed by the public and somebody complained about it then the playwright as well as the actors could get into serious trouble and the trouble could go so far as imprisonment or losing a hand or so on and so forth punishment was fairly strict about such things so if it offended against either the crown and principally this was about offending against the crown so if it offended against the crown or against the church there could be major consequences for the entire company now plays also during this period were not protected by copyright today we think of that as rather strange that how can something not belong to the person who wrote it but during this period it did not belong to the author instead the play was sold to the company so if the company bought it then it became the property of the playing company rather than the property of the author and the playing company could if they chose it publish it or they could just keep it for themselves so there was no copyright and there was no single ownership of any play as well and and this is something which students of english literature will find interesting that this was not none of this was literature at all plays were seen as entertainment it would be like saying that in today's world if we were to say that tv serials are serious literary texts they are not they are entertainment similarly during this period the theater of the times so of the plays that were produced in the theater was seen as entertainment and not as literature and this is attested to by the fact that people who were building beginning to build libraries during this period did not buy play books to keep in the library they used to ignore those they used to buy poetry they used to buy other kinds of books but they would not buy plays to include in their libraries we move on now to take a look at the theater itself the structure of the theater during this period now theaters during this time were usually built on the outskirts of london city and this is not because of any particular reason other than the fact that theaters were seen as places of disruption as places where confusion existed where there was theft and all manner of vice so they were not placed within the city where respectable people lived instead it was in the outskirts and people had to go out of the city if they wanted to witness a drama being enacted now theaters were built as large and extremely large near circular structures with many sides so some of them were eight sided some of them were even bigger than that they seated between 2 and 3000 viewers and when we think about our theaters today which are fairly small to think of 2 to 3000 people going to watch a play in the middle of the afternoon and without loudspeakers without any kind of equipment which would transmit the voice that far you have to wonder at exactly how this worked now these large structures had galleries around three sides around all the sides and in addition to that they had a large standing area in the middle now these galleries around the sides were where people had to pay money to sit but the cheapest seats if you can call them that was to stand in the middle and watch the play now standing in the middle made it of course for one it was not sloped so therefore your viewing was slightly problematic you may not see anything if a tall guy was standing in front of you but it also gave you better hearings because you were far closer to the stage the further away the galleries being at the extreme edges would have given you better views but would have given you less of the sound effects now performances were held in the afternoon and this again of course becomes more interesting because performances being held in the afternoon is because there is no lightings to speak of at this period in time we have not yet got electricity so there is nothing that helps people to watch anything later on in the evening so they were held in the afternoon and they were held every day of the week other than sunday and holy days of the church so think of the number of plays that were then staged during a year every afternoon there would be a performance and there were quite a few theaters by the time the renaissance drama is at its height there was about 6 to 8 theaters at the edges of the city now performances every afternoon and every day of the week except for sundays and during the month of lent so there were a lot of plays which were being staged during this period because there was no lighting they had to be held in the afternoon and it was held in the afternoon given good weather or bad so you could stand in the rain also and watch a play and in addition to this props were also at a minimum now props being at a minimum is also important because these were things which are run on shoestring budgets more or less so they were not the kind of props which we see in late victorian or in the 20th century were not available there so you had to use a lot of your imagination and you had to listen to what was being said to understand what was happening on stage costumes were however 
seen as very important. So they used to have really beautiful, gorgeous costumes. And one of the interesting facts is that noble men and women, when they were dying, often gifted several of their rich costumes to playing companies because then they would use it on stage and those costumes would continue to be used. And costumes were more expensive than everything else on the London stage, apart from the plays themselves, for which the play scripts, which were bought by people for their playing companies. Props also had a symbolic value. So people understood automatically that if they see something, then this is what it indicates. One, of course, the example is of a skull. So when you see a skull, everybody should understand that we are now going to be talking about mortality. But they also had other ones. Like if there was a globe in a... Uh, St on the stage, then it meant that this was the room of a scholar. If there was a handkerchief, the handkerchief indicated either th that the person who was carrying it was a courtier or that there was something fishy going on, that there was sexual immorality going on and so on and so forth. So props also had symbolic value which was immediately understood by the audience itself. Now the playing companies of the period were stake joint shareholding companies and they had to have a noble patron. This is important because the noble patron whom they were affiliated to or whose name, under whose name they worked, that person was supposedly, in theory at least, responsible for them and he was accountable for them. So if they did something that was terribly disruptive, then that person could be called to order and the company itself could be called to order. Thus we have playing companies during this period, which include the Lord Chamberlain's men, the Ad Lord Admiral's men, the King's men later on, the Queen's men, and so on and so forth. Initially there were a lot of playing companies, but by the time 1600 or thereabouts, we have two main playing companies. One were the Lord Chamberlain's men and the other were the Lord Admiral's men. So when you think about what was happening, you also see the beginnings of capitalism in one sense. The ones who were successful lasted. The ones who weren't fell by the roadside. Now, these were shareholding organizations and usually there were about 9 to 12 people who built up this company amongst themselves. In amongst those 9 to 12 people, there would be one who would be the principal actor. So in Shakespeare's company, which is the Lord Chamberlain's men, later on the King's men, you had somebody called the Burbages. The Burbages, father and son, and Richard Burbage was the principal actor. He performed all the main roles in all of Shakespeare's plays in those first years. You would have one guy who was a principal actor. The others did all the other jobs. So, and those jobs were many, from the maintenance of costumes through taking in the money at the gates so that the viewers who came paid. There were no tickets, but at least they had to pay when they walked in. So they were called gatherers, the people who stood at the gates. So all these jobs were performed by the remaining 9 to 12 shareholders. But these were not the only people who were there in the company when the performance was going on. They also had apprentices. Now apprentices were usually young boys who ran away or came to the theatre and became a part of the playing company. They were particularly useful because young boys whose voices have not broken could play the roles of the women in the place that were being put up. So they were very significant. Those apprentices also later on, of course, could, if they were good at their work and if they were accepted by the other shareholders, they could then become a part of the playing company itself. There were also some hired men, actors as well as non-actors, who were responsible for keeping up all the work that was necessary to put up a play during this period. Finally, now we come to a brief, a very brief look at the major playwrights. Now, in each of the units devoted to the major playwrights, there will be a short write-up about their life and time, so we will not be looking at that so much. Instead, what we need to know about this time is that these playwrights, none of them worked in isolation. Most of them knew several of the others. So if you were to think about the network that existed, it was a network society in one sense because the writer of the Spanish tragedy, Kid, he knew Christopher Marlowe. Ben Johnson knew Shakespeare. Others, all of them knew each other. So what we see is a bunch of playwrights who are writing plays but who did not then sit alone and do so. Instead, they all collaborated with each other. They worked with each other. They discussed scenes and stories. Sometimes they decided that they would write a play together. So they worked together and they asked each other's advice. Was, in one sense, it's also, even while it was a competitive society, whose play is doing better, it was also a cooperative society in that they worked together to improve each other's plays. There is also suspicions that some, uh, Middleton might have been responsible for parts of Shakespeare's Macbeth. 
We know that Shakespeare collaborated in towards the end of his career with other playwrights. Bo Bendit Fletcher wrote all the plays together. So these were people who then did not work in isolation but worked with each other through their careers. The theatre was also seen as a place wherein playwrights could then derive could make their fortune, could move upward in society, could make a life for themselves. There were a few playwrights who came from the upper middle classes of society during this period, but several of the playwrights of the time were also from the poorer strata. So you have Bricklayer's son, you have Glover's sons, you have Shoemaker's sons, who then, because they got a basic education in plays and they started writing plays, they could make enough money to climb upwards in society and again Shakespeare becomes an ex uh, example of this because he begins as the son of a fairly prosperous glover but then prosperity fails, his, father fa his father's business fails and later on it is Shakespeare's work that enables them, helps them to buy a house in Stratford-upon-Avon and to live a life of comfort. So if you were a successful playwright then you were enabled to move higher in society and you also made friends in high places. Interestingly, if you were a successful playwright and you belonged to a good playing company, then at some point or the other you also met the king or the queen of the period. You met noblemen and noble women. People sought out your company. So upward mobility is one significant aspect of how drama during this period shaped the lives of people. But once again to return to a fact that we have noted earlier. Playwrights were not seen as great literary figures. They were, they were seen as entertaining, they were seen as telling great stories, but they were not literary figures. As such, they did not enjoy literary respectability. People did not look upon them with the kind of respect that they gave to poets. Instead, they looked upon them as if they were mere entertainers. So today we have looked at uh, some of the backgrounds for the study of Renaissance drama. There are a whole lot more of them which we have not been looking at but which you can read about in various books. Today we looked upon travel and exploration and the changes it made to English society. We also looked at the role of the other and who played that role in early modern society. We did a brief background to the theatre, the playing companies and the drama of the time. Thank you.